I'm going to do a shout out and say hello, especially to Deb McCaffrey. Hey, Deb, great to see you. Um, Deb was one of our um, domain consultants in research IT for a number of years, and now she's at Michigan, and she helped uh, pull this uh, presentation together. So um, welcome, everybody. Um, I'll start out with a, a couple of announcements and thank yous. Um, I'd like to thank our uh, planners and folks who engage with us on preparing. This is uh, being the Division of Computing, Data Science and Society. Um, also Information Services Technology at UC Berkeley, Research IT, my group, and Skydeck, uh, which is our uh, incubator program at UC Berkeley. So thanks to, uh, to all those planners. Um, a couple of announcements. We have an AWS uh, 101 training coming up on June 16th uh, at 1030. Um, and so um, people uh, on this call are invited to join that. And our second announcement has to do with the um, Pacific Research Platform Capstone Symposium Project. I'm going to um, ask Camille Crittenden to uh, talk to us a little bit about that. Camille. Great, thanks so much, Jason. And thanks to everyone for the invitation to make a quick announcement about this event coming up in June. I'm excited as you uh, may have heard from previous presentations and such, uh, the Pacific Research Platform has been an NSF funded grant program that's gone on for the last five and a half years or so coming up to its end uh, early this fall. So we're going to host a capstone symposium the morning of June 22nd, and I'll put information in the chat so you can take a look at uh, what's there for the Zoom registration and and the agenda. Uh, we'll have a keynote talk by Larry Smarr, who's the PI on that uh, UC San Diego um, longtime professor, now Professor Emeritus. And then what I think will be really interesting is we'll have a couple of panels, one devoted to the scientific domain applications of this broadband, you know, large scale internet infrastructure um, from fields like particle physics and uh, water research. Uh, genetics and genomics, um, plant biology. So there will be some really interesting, you know, short presentations there. And then we'll also have another panel on research IT and the intersection with some of this um, emerging technology and really large scale data transfer. And some of the network engineers who were instrumental in creating the whole backbone and infrastructure of it. So um, people from UC San Diego and UC Merced and elsewhere. So I hope that you'll all be able to tune in for at least part of it. I think it'll be a really interesting morning and we will probably record it. We haven't quite worked out all those details, um, but would love for you to be there in person in real time. I mean, in person, meaning virtually as most things are now. So yes, that will be on Zoom and I'll put some details in the chat. Thank you for letting me uh, make an announcement today. Great. Thank you so much, Camille. Um... All right, so uh, in tradition, we do a short survey at this time. So we hand it over to Amy Neeser and she will lead us through um, doing a survey. Hey folks, it's great to see so many of you here today. So please go to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com and enter the code that you see at the top of the screen here, which is 78768248. And we'd love to know where you're joining us from today. You'll see we have a lot of categories. We've got feedback from the last few meetups. Wanna make sure everybody's included. This is great. We've got some students here today, a lot of IT staff, staff. We've got some guests. I think those might be our University of Michigan guests. Lawrence Berkeley National Lab is here. Fantastic. All righty. Well, welcome, everybody. And we have another question for you. So this is related to our topic today. Um, when you think about DevOps, what does that mean to you?
like all over the place here. So collaboration and culture are standing out to me. I'm also seeing buzzword, rapid development, glue, deployment, growth, innovation, research support, agile, excellent. Thank you. Automation. All right, and we have one more question for you. So when you think about the benefits of DevOps, what's at the top of your list? So might be some similar answers to the last one. But what are some benefits? Automation, collaboration, agile development, efficiency, safety, interesting. I love whoever put reproducibility in there. We are aligned. That's what I was thinking. Efficiency, modern, security. Agree, consistency. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Well, I hope that this whet your appetites for our talks that we have today. And thanks very much for participating. Great, thank you, Amy. <clears throat> so um, our speakers today come from Michigan Medicine and University of Michigan. Um, and they are Chanel Bolyut, Melissa Thurber and John Walsh. Um, they're going to present today on how they improved Michigan Medicine's ability to deploy, develop, and manage custom and vendor applications in an efficient, secure, and reliable way. They will share how Michigan Medicine takes advantage of infrastructure as code, cloud APIs, and um, inclusion of more compensating controls for security and compliance um, into their system. So with that, uh, very much, I'd like to welcome our speakers and hand it off to them. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. I think John was going to share his screen if he has controls. Yep, I, uh, I'm trying it now. I said at first I could not, but here we go. Perfect. All right. Your cloud looks a little bit smaller there for some reason than, than it does on my screen, but that's OK. <laughs> uh, so just picture big cloud at Michigan Medicine. It's a long time to get here, and so we don't want to uh, to diminish the importance there. So uh, sounds like we've already had an introduction. Thank you, Jason and Amy, for inviting us, and Deb McCaffrey from from our group and Academic IT for making the connection there. So um, so yeah, I think I think we've done the intros, um, but we're going to talk more about who we are in terms of DevOps and who we are as Michigan Medicine IT or what they've uh, coined us HITS and we were told we were never allowed to call ourselves HITS but everybody calls ourselves HITS so HITS from <laughs> Michigan Medicine Health IT um, services uh, so we're going to go through our story and our history our journey to cloud it was a long journey um, a long journey that started with a buzzword, Kubernetes, that nobody could pronounce. And um, everyone made fun of, including me, until they learned how valuable it was. So John's going to take us through some of that history, and Chanel will as well. Um, how do we get here today? What is our product? Uh, we are very proud to be a standard enterprise um, endorsed product now within Michigan Medicine. So we're, we are live in production. We have about a thousand solutions, tens of thousands of users on any given uh, high scale day. <laughs> and, um, and so we wanna talk to you about that. Some of the red herrings and assumptions that we encountered along the way. Um, what's next for us? Some of those pesky outstanding hurdles that we haven't quite figured out yet and um, end with our vision for building a culture and Michigan medicine within the software development community, and then a Q and A. So I think the next slide here, Chanel, were you going to take this one? Yeah. 
Yep, Great. I've got that one. Great. Hi, everyone. All right. So who are we, the DevOps team? Um, well, as Melissa mentioned, we're part of the Michigan Medicine Health Information Technology and Services. Um, we are in the academic IT division, so we are supporting research and the medical school at Michigan Medicine, um, primarily, but we're, our, our scope is somewhat broader as well. Um, we, our DevOps team is known as the Wayfaring Narwhals. Um, we are, our current incarnation is uh, three engineers who spend most of their day in a Zoom room together, uh, mob programming, and Melissa and myself, the two product managers. Um, our origin, uh, originally uh, the team was formed to support a group of about 20 uh, software developers and um, using with you know fairly legacy applications uh, that were on-prem on VMs. Um, now, three years later, we are supporting the cloud. We are open to all developers in Michigan Medicine who want to come with us to the cloud. Yeah. Thanks very much, Now, And for those of you that don't know me, I'm John. I'm the DevOps lead. And so, as you might have guessed, you know, Michigan and like Berkeley has some long storied history and in infrastructure. And um, the movement from the 70s, just big iron you know, all the way through from, you know, the our, our various terminal server iterations all the way up till the present. Um, we have a lot of different needs and um, ourselves being part of Michigan Medicine. Our first data center was st stood up, I think, in the early 80s and uh, was just big, heavy infrastructure. A lot of a lot of the fun, funner, older uh, main mainframe names you might remember, um, and some of the ASs and the IBMs and all that was stood up to support the clinical enterprise. And um, over the last oh, you know, 10, 15 years, there's been a huge shift in the IT industry. And Michigan Medicine has been watching and paying attention, but we've, uh, I should say we don't have a whole lot of mainframes anymore, but <laughs> we, have, we have moved beyond that. But um, nevertheless, there was, there was, there's still a great um, history and data centers on premise across our campus that, you know, are actually quite excellent and have been, you know, modernized and upgraded and so on. So we have a very strong on-premise infrastructure. And, but one of the things that seemed to be sort of lacking as, as again, the industry has moved was that we also have other customers or parts of Michigan medicine, especially around the academic side of the medical school that were needing small, quick, agile uh, environments and that was really not a great fit for Michigan medicine as a whole. You know, our, we had a very strong relegated shared infrastructure teams that manage these various pieces. So, you know, even big apps, though, however, are, are starting to move towards, you know, modernization, hybrid cloud. There's, there, there's at least these whispers across the clinical enterprise that some of these things might be useful, but nevertheless, there is still a strong need even now, by now meaning five years ago, that you know, we have something for a, a quick environment. Um, so to kind of talk into that, we, we started out uh, three years ago, as Chanel mentioned, with starting up what we were hoping to be was our first of many clinical environments. And um, a few of us had been parts of different infrastructure teams within HITS and it's, it's some of its predecessor departments and things. And we started out to basically start, like just get an environment for a particular need. And so I'm gonna show you, and I'm just gonna, every time you see a different color here, actually, maybe I should stop sharing. Can, can you pin me or something? Uh, let's see. Yeah, if you want, pin me, please, so you can see this. <laughs> but basically, this is a, a value stream map starting, actually, it's, it's missing a page. It started in February of, of this particular year. Every time you see a different color, that's a different team and us basically making a request, talking to someone, having a meeting, running, you know, some, some tests, getting an approval. <laughs> And here we are, some months later, 
it was 10 months later, our production deployment uh, here. So um, needless to say, <laughs> this was not something that uh, we could continue as a team. And, and guess what? We needed to do it all over again. Um, are you seeing my slides again? Yes, good, okay, thanks. So <laughs> we had a big problem here that, and to, to total it up, there, there, was, there was about 12 teams and um, the developer at Michigan Medicine was responsible for taking this thing through the environment process. And believe it or not, developers have a lot, lot of other things to do besides, you know, have meetings and talk to different groups to just ask for some storage or to, you know, put a ticket in and then that they come back with a bunch of very uh, deep integrated questions because that's their, their wheelhouse. So speed of environment was a real problem. And it was just, again, back in this clinical enterprise, a lot of these pieces were interfaced you know, by, by different vendors or what have you. And so each of these shared services had, had a great expertise and had a lot of great questions, but there was nothing really tying any of these pieces together to form a system, you know, a system of creating an environment. Um, to kind of speak to that, like one of, the, one of our other challenges, like after this environment has stood up was that, um, we were sort of, in a way, kind of starting to play middleman between the, those 20 developers that Chanel mentioned and, um, and all these other teams. We were basically just trying to, okay, well, maybe we can just sort of have someone else in software development called the DevOps team sort of handle this. And, but then we found actually a lot of policies that were rather restrictive, including virtual machines that were owned, quote unquote, by us, but we couldn't actually use a package manager on those virtual machines. You know, if I wanted get text installed on a virtual machine, I needed to put a ticket in with that particular team that does the package installs. And um, if I wanted to build some configuration as code automation that maybe doesn't install the package, um, but perhaps maybe just does some configuration, well, guess what? I've now got to do some other work so that I can get my environment ready so that I can apply some configuration as code that isn't in configuration as code. And um, bottom line was we, we said, okay, let's, let's just take a step back and talk about <laughs> these problems. And our resource constraints was that there was basic, there was three, uh, three engineers who we had a giant funnel of people that said, I need environments, I need environments, and I, I only need it for a week, right? <laughs> or I only, I only need it for a few days to do, run a particular research project. Or um, I'm just doing this for a quick test of my particular piece of code that I want to run in, that, in some infrastructure. Um, all those problems really just bubbled up. And so our solution that we felt based on some research and some other, other places was that, well, Kubernetes actually does this very well. Um, you can assign large pieces of infrastructure to the Kubernetes nodes, and then you can uh, give little tenancies within Kubernetes, and the developers themselves can help um, wire, wire their environments together. And so that, that produced a, a level of automation and self-service. We could and we, we kind of, we actually built up a, a, a pretty cool system where we had our load balancers fronting um, a Kubernetes environment and we could actually spin up a new Kubernetes environment entirely automated and then migrate the apps over to it and then slowly turn off, you know, connections to the old cluster and just delete it. In fact, that's how we did upgrades in our world, which was something that many teams were just shocked and surprised by. Um, but it actually pr produced a wonderful effect for our developers where their, all their infrastructure upgrades never has the app down. Um, and it's just very powerful if the app can handle those sort of things. So um, Kubernetes provided a lot of that, but then we found new problems. Guess what happens when you just need another terabyte of space? You still have to do this old method. You still have to walk through some of that value stream. And, um, and for our space where developers are saying, you know, I, I need, I need this, 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 
and okay, great, Kubernetes can handle it up until we run out of resources. And so we kept just running into resource constraints. We, we were running into other, other problems with that. Um, we ran into, you know, and, and I should say too, like we also ran into problems with like stateful applications, right? And so in, in this way, Kubernetes for, for us proved to be a little bit of a red herring because all it did was just kind of um, build up inventory of large compute instances, large storage, that then still had to be created and maintained and walk through particular processes only to find ourselves, <laughs> you know, back to saying, sorry, customer, it, it won't be 10 months, but it's going to be three months because we got to walk through some new process or what have you, right? So we weren't seeing um, a lot of that, that, that benefit that we were really hoping to see. You know, we, we could see it in some small cases, but the reality was we would, we would still just, all we were doing was just adding buffers. And that did not feel well either. Um, so hence our new solution that's based on Google Kubernetes engine. So we found a lot of great benefits from Kubernetes. Like I said, developers able to um, use in a way infrastructure as code, build a manifest of what they, they're asking for, you know, a bill of materials that says, this is, these are the things I need. And then um, from there, they can just deploy an environment. And we still have to walk through some IA processes, but we've, we've actually whittled that down quite a bit and kind of done a lot on the front end. And we've done a lot on the back end to say, here um, is, a, is a, an already approved environment that then is sort of a rubber stamp that we can just push out. Um, so we can basically, we can start with a pre-containerized app. So that's one thing right now is that it, it must be a containerized app because it's running on Google Kubernetes engine. Um, Google manages those migrations that I was talking about that took us a lot of time to automate and build. Um, you know, we had, we had spent a lot of time saying, okay, well, how do we upgrade this like a node without any downtime? And how do we, you know, have apps that might be stateful, talk, you know, like get turned off slowly and the other ones turn on. And we, we had walked through a lot on-prem that Google just frankly managed. <laughs> So it was very exciting for us to say, okay, that's wonderful. Here we are on this, this new journey of being able to say, here's, here's your environment, dear developer. And um, so what it, what it includes is basically, if you're familiar with Google Cloud Platform, a developer can request an environment that actually corresponds to a Google Cloud project. And in that project, we... Um, this team uh, uses some templating and a product called Terraform to kind of provide a interface to the Google APIs. So basically at a high level via Google APIs, we spin up um, a couple of networks for them, a couple of Google clusters for them, um, a, a database instance that they can then add their databases to, some storage, some other pieces, and then that's all actually configurable uh, on our end via this, these automations and via some variables that say, maybe I want a uh, compute size that's much larger. Well, it's just one little line change and go apply that same Terraform state to this one project. And guess what? <laughs> they have their environment exactly as needed. And there are some uh, processes to around firewalls and other things to ensure security. But um, for the most part, though, we can basically take, okay, we've got inputs from customers. We can take that and then translate that into so, to our variables that say, this is the bill of materials for a, a customer environment. And we can push a button. And then 27 minutes later, their environment is ready for them. And we have some basic documentation around it, some pieces for them to say, or, and, and some space for them to request more help from us if they're, you know, this is their first experience in the cloud, et cetera. And, and as we get these questions, we're then building documentation to help other people on board as well. So this has been sort of our journey from 11 months <laughs> to a pre-approved environment in 27 minutes. So uh, very powerful for us. Hey, John, 
I'm thinking that uh, before we talk about the DevSecOps services that we built on top of our platform, maybe we jump to the next slide, which goes fairly well with um, what you yeah. were talking about, yep. which kind of describes the platform itself. Yep. Uh, and some of the uh, Google products that we're, you know, GCP products that we are using in order to kind of stand up our platform. So maybe I'll give a high level overview and then you can jump back in um, and speak more to even some of what you were talking about, like Terraform, we don't necessarily have on here. But um, essentially, this is our environment. This is our ecosystem. We have our internal and external users coming to our application um, clusters through a secure gateway, leveraging cloud IAM, as well as firewall rules, load balancing and cloud armor. And then we have uh, SAML authentication, which is a requirement from our uh, information assurance um, security team at, at Michigan Medicine. Um, we have developers right now leveraging container registry uh, we're deploying through container registry and the vulnerability scanning that's available kind of out of the box through there, um, which, which is great, but we, we actually have a change of plans for the future, but this is our, our current product. Um, you can see there our GKE cluster. We are, um, right now our product includes a cloud SQL database, um, with the potential to ex kind of diversify our database options in the future. John, maybe you can speak a little bit more to that. Um, and then we've got storage backups. And then um, our information assurance teams are very happy that all of our logging is feeding into our Splunk instance. And that um, is then um, reviewed and verified and monitored by our cybersecurity teams. And so you know, networking is happy, um, cybersecurity and information assurance is happy, and uh, we're trying really hard to make our development teams happy too. So <laughs> we'll talk a little bit more about the service that we felt was necessary to build on top of this, but John, um, go ahead and speak, you know, any more to, to this here. You've done a great job there. I, th I think, yeah, the, the big piece for us is that, I mean, it does require some perhaps changes from a legacy development environment um, in order to take advantage of this. And that's um, still, you know, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit, but that's still in some ways, I think the right direction for us. Um, so that for instance, logging, um, many legacy environments don't necessarily log to the standard out in their containers. Um, so we oftentimes have to do some extra work to help the developer say, well, well, how do I get my logs up into Google Cloud so that then they can get over to our operations in our uh, information assurance so that they can, you know, at least perhaps see some patterns of access or other issues that may, may be of concern for um, Michigan Medicine as a whole or this particular app that might be, you know, less than perfect or <laughs> or perhaps hacked right we hope not but you never know so um i will say too that kind of by breaking these things into their own small little micro segmented projects also limits a lot of that blast radius when something does go aside or awry so in a way we we, we did this so that developers actually can have a lot more views around their the environment around their apps they don't have to look, you know, dig down if they don't want to, but if they do need to, to help debug or have an issue, they can. Um, and so one thing that kind of speaks to this is this cloud IAM on the top left that we're able to give developers exactly what they need, but no more. And if they need more, they can request more. Um, and we hope to actually even have that sort of walk through a, um, an automated ish process that you know a developer can request up to X and then you know over that we they can uh, walk through a more manual assurance process so there's there's lots of things that we're looking to improve here but at, at, a, at a base level that, that that's kind of our big piece is like ensuring the integrity and and so this is actually I guess I should switch back right so we're going back into the DevSecOps portion so let me switch back there. Yeah, you want me to go through this one? Sure. Thanks. Okay, so um, a little bit more history. 
um, as to why we, we decided to build a service or actually we, we needed to build a service around the platform. So, you know, all the cloud platforms are available basically in a self-service model through the University of Michigan, right? So teams over on the university side have been developing apps, self-service and hosting them themselves, you know, little teams in different departments, um, you know, with, with little problem, little not too much oversight that they couldn't, you know, they couldn't handle um, on the university side. But on the Michigan medicine side, you deal with PHI and you deal with high data, a lot of high data sensitivity projects and teams. We've got teams inside of the IT organization doing software development. We've got teams, a lot of teams outside of the software or out, outside of the IT organization doing software development. I mean, you have teams with grants that are trying to spin up different applications to collect data on wearables. Um, for example, I worked with an app where they had interns, medical interns wearing uh, Fitbits to collect their vitals in order to study um, intern burnout and, and different you know, health outcomes of being a medical school intern. So, Lots of really exciting work. Some of it is fairly short term, depending on the grant life, you know, life uh, or timeline. And so, um, you know, our information surety assurance group has a very high bar, especially if you want to use the cloud. And so that was really uh, limiting, you know, our research teams, some of our academic teams, and some of our clinical teams from, from you know, doing the work that they wanted to do or some of them were just doing it themselves without any kind of transparency with the IT organization, which um, you know, isn't great either. And so in order to try and make it uh, consumable for them, make this product consumable for them and make it friendly, like if we're not going to shut you down, um, we needed to build a service around this. And so with that, um, to try and normalize some of the diversity of all these teams we've got all over the place. Um, we have standardized developer tooling that they can leverage and that we support. We're still working on standing that up, but it um, was, has been available for a smaller group of developers for quite some time. Um, we've got our secure application lifecycle that um, you know, is, is basically um, leveraging a lot of automation in order to, you know, meet these standards, these security standards, scanning, we mentioned the vulnerability scanning, networking, cert management, all that monitoring that we showed you through Splunk, um, disaster re recovery, you know, offering a platform here that is, um, you know, a highly reliable platform, that is a really big buzzword. You want to talk about buzzwords in a in a hospital environment, <laughs> high reliability is right there. Um, and then on top of that is process standardization and support. Once you come into the fold where we want you, where things are secure and transparent, they need some help to navigate and especially to get that approval from information assurance. And so we're trying to streamline that. We've worked hand in hand with the security teams to streamline things and, um, and allow teams to actually make it through in their, you know, given their short turnaround um, timeframes. Yeah, so um, this slide I hope kind of describes what, uh, what allows us to be free to help with some of these issues with developers. On the blue um, in the future state is actually what Google Cloud platform at U of M takes care of for us. Um, and then the red is what generally, at least right now, we are taking care of as a DevOps team. And we hope to be able to you know, expand the use of other teams. You know, As I said, we have a great depth of shared services here. Um, but as they get on board with different technologies in the cloud, we hope to be able to leverage them as well for um, more and more uh, of the, the red portions. And then we can take on more and more of some of the more onerous yellow portions for developers. So they can really work more closely on securing their applications and building better applications and better features for customers. So on the left side is the current state. And by that, we mean our, our on-premise state and various infrastructure teams own various pieces of the um, this sort of, I guess, pizza analogy uh, where 
you know, developers have to uh, just starting even at like compute infrastructure developers oftentimes are, again, asking and requiring different things of the compute infrastructure teams. And uh, so their responsibility or their their context has to be up to X. And again, back to like packages, like, you know what package you want, um, perhaps the compute infrastructure team does not. And so how does that work and how do you manage that? So the developer has to have a, what I what I call, they don't, not only do they not have what I call locality around, you know, their, their environment or their application, they actually have to uh, communicate that and learn it so that they can communicate it effectively to the right teams. And so they have to basically learn sort of these various team jargons all the way up the stack. And so in this future state, um, of this shared responsibility matrix, like us as infrastructure teams are actually, we are basically now taking over the red portion. Um, so we're actually doing this with three engineers because of wonderful, you know, advances in automation and abilities. So developers have, you know, some things to worry about logging, you know, patching of their application, you know, for security vulnerabilities or what have you, um, making, maintaining security policies. If their app, is basically what what, I, what we often call sort of our, our single stateless app. What do they do in a disaster? We have everything backed up, but how do you develop or manage that? Um, you know, like everything goes down and we've got to redeploy to AWS or some other place of Google, or we have to deploy to on-prem. You know, there's still a piece that the developer has to know. And, and, I, and I think it's, it, it's very much needed. And, and so what I feel like what we're doing is we're actually taking it to the point where a developer's view of the system is, is available. They can go down that stack if they need to, as I mentioned before, but we're actually kind of taking care of it for them so they don't have to worry about it and communicate it. So when they need that context, they can get it, but they don't have to have it at every step of the, the environment creation process and then every time the environment changes. So this for us is a real huge benefit of the product we're offering here. And so um, this is a much, <laughs> much larger poster that we presented, when was that, November, I think, of last year. Um, and, it, and it has a lot on there, and, and some of the which we kind of will We'll zoom in a little bit on, on each of these pieces, but at, at, a, at a high level, you know, here, here's what we kind of walked through and said, he, here's, here's something that um, as, as a vision, right? We, we want developers to not, and researchers as well, event, and we want people who like know what they want and can build that, but oftentimes don't either don't want to be bothered by certain uh, lower level concerns or they, they're, they're interested in it. But the, the concern there is that they don't wanna be stymied by this space, right? They don't want to be having to learn, you know, every in and out of every Google Cloud Platform piece in order to stand up their application. Or, and again, as, as I mentioned kind of earlier, some of these researchers are, are actually spinning up stuff for a month, <laughs> you know, going back to that 11th month process, like it just doesn't work that way. Um, so, so we were kind of taking this at a high level vision and saying, okay, what are we looking at here? And, you know, sort of some of our first iterations of this was that we really said, okay, well, let's, let's just try and make Google Cloud a... Um, just an extension of our data center, right? So, so we, we got a VPN and put it in Google Cloud, but that really did prove to be um, a red herring. It, 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 it doesn't do what, what, what we thought it would. It doesn't actually make developers' lives easier. In fact, it makes their lives more complicated if they want to reach back for resources. They have to walk through various processes that frankly we were unaware of because we had never gone outside the data center before and walked through the process of moving things through the VPN um, as the DevOps team. You know, and so we were able to kind of pivot to that. And as we mentioned, we started, we started using Cloud Armor policies that would protect the outside of this little tiny, tiny little micro segmented network and ensure that the communication is protected, that it's going to the right places, that um, developers have ways of being able to manage 
you know, how this works and manage it in a, in a, in a very assured compliant process. So kind of taking each, each one of these little red herrings um, has been an interesting process for us. And we also thought that we had heard from many developers that they're very interested in containers, containerization, Docker. Um, and we, we thought that they would be really ready for um, being able to just say, being able to build containers, run them in, in a Kubernetes cluster. But we found that there actually was a lot of lack of knowledge around how to how to build containers securely, how to push containers into various places and get them scanned, how to ensure that your the base image, as it's called, the, the thing that you kind of like build your image on is also assured. Um, and, and, and many other pieces around Kubernetes itself, like Kubernetes is also a, a, a kind of a whole ecosystem of things. And so there was a lot of buzzwords around, you know, various, um, various technologies within Kubernetes that in some ways we, we can start to support as we get further along, but we um, were able to just say, here is our base offering. And we started to sort of move towards, okay, we, instead we're, we're, we're not gonna do you know, the, everything and the kitchen sink. Instead, we're going to um, just focus on these particular basic needs and go from there. Um, you know, additionally, every time we needed something from the on-premise services, we found that it just didn't exist. There's no APIs back to sort of our same problem that we had experienced with Kubernetes on-premise. Basically, um, we had to walk through manual processes. So like we weren't actually getting many of the benefits of the cloud whenever we had to integrate with our on-premise firewall. If we have to integrate with our on-premise DNS, instead we have to build up automations around that to support it. And instead of, and then have to walk through a process as we walked through these red herrings to say, is this really adding any value to the customer or is it adding any security to the customer? And in many cases it was not. And so we were able to say, okay, well, maybe we can take our own DNS subdomain and then deliver that to developers in their own subdomain of our subdomain. And then that allowed us to be able to provide, um, you know, again, that environment space. And then if developers want a nice name, they can do C names across it. If it uh, maybe I'm getting a little deep, but uh, <laughs> yeah. So, so we, we basically kind of tried to solve each one of these problems. And then kind of the next piece that I think is really important for us is that, and this is really where we're focusing our efforts now, and, and we're utilizing GitLab as our, our product. And GitLab is not the best one of any one of these steps in our little pipeline. <laughs> so, but it has all those steps integrated into one sort of pane of glass for us. And so we, we went with GitLab to help us um, kind of give developers who maybe have never even seen what's called a CI CD pipeline, a continuous integration and continuous delivery pipeline, like, like a, a place for them to wet their feet in and give them templates of uh, ways of doing this kind of work based on different Java, Python, Go, like some of the, and end node, and, and basically give them some templates of, here's, here's a, a reasonable way to go about um, deploying your application to our, to our environment, to, to that environment that you just asked for. And not only that, if you walk through some of these processes, you don't have to meet with these six, six or seven different security officers and other pieces because guess what, you got scanned, you got some other stuff done, and instead that stuff can then be rolled into a report for those various groups, and they can even run their reports off of those reports, and you developer don't even know until perhaps something happens or they're concerned about something. And so it's really powerful um, to be able to containerize their app, deploy it to our, our environment, and, um, be able to then use Google monitoring themselves to say, is my app up? I can create a, an alerting policy if my app is not up and walk, give them some documentation around it. So where we stand today, we've got some um, outstanding hurdles uh, remaining in our product and in wider adoption. Um, first one is right now, as John spoke to, we have a lot of uh, non-functional requirements mainly coming from our information assurance uh, security folks. Um, kind of uh, because we are the first to really go big into the cloud and we're the first to put 
sensitive data in the cloud. We have all the eyes on us. We're meeting with multiple teams. We actually had both campus and um, medical uh, information assurance groups, two different groups involved in assuring us along with a third group compliance. Um, so we have all these teams, they're coming at us with different overlapping requirements. Um, and then they also get some, uh, you know, oh, well, gosh, the cloud can do this. So can you implement this extra layer of security too? Because we've got all these great features out there, um, which is all great, but we also have deadlines in which we have to go live. Um, there's also just a lot of uh, processes and sometimes processes that are being written as we're going through them. So they keep changing. Um, we just had one of those. <laughs> so um, we're always just trying to get to that uh, get to that point where we can get uh, approved to go live. So that's still a um, longer process than we'd like. But again, that new pipeline should help with that considerably. Um, from a funding standpoint, uh, we currently basically recharge on the Google Cloud. So anything Google charges us just goes directly to the department that wants to host in Google. Um, on the in the meantime, if you wanted to host on-prem, many of our departments can host on-prem and they won't be charged back. So um, that can be pretty daunting to decide to go to cloud. Yes, it's faster, but oh, now you're paying for it out of your department budget. Um, so we are also working on, on uh, getting parity on that. Um, <clears throat> organizationally, we're still kind of working with senior management to get a overall direction and full commitment to like the uh, the future data center um, data center moder uh, maturity uh, modernizing sorry data center modernization uh, direction um, so that is underway committee meetings happening um, we've also are dealing with as John spoke to um, the developer technical maturity um, so we're still have we have a lot of people who are very interested in our product but they do not know yet how to containerize. So we're working on both, you know, giving, you know, providing them with some tools and some um, direction and some documentation and videos and labs and things like that. And we're also working um, for legacy applications where they don't really, no one has the time, no one really wants to put in a lot of time to completely redevelop the application. We're working on some pipelines that could containerize these legacy applications or allow them to run in a containerized environment. Um, from a technical standpoint, um, we do have some apps that are just going to be too big and complex to move to the cloud, too many integrations, too many things to refactor. Um, we've also got applications there where no one really wants to maintain the application or do any improvements, but no one wants to shut them down. Um, so we're still, still working through those. Um, on the GCP side, we are still working on our VPN, our initial our initial thought for VPN was to pay for one VPN and then be able to kind of segment it and share it with all the projects that needed it. Um, ran into a lot of technical hurdles there. So now we're working on a micro VPN architecture, one VPN for each project that needs it. Um, from a vulnerability management standpoint, we've got this great vulnerability scanning with Google, but we don't really have any tools to manage the vulnerabilities. So it's sort of a manual go out and look and compare to what you had last week. Do you have anything new? Do you have anything to address? If it's a false positive, there's no good way to mark it. So one of the great things with moving to GitLab is they have those tools for vulnerability management and they do have that container scanning. So sort of our next move. Yeah, and uh, no DevOps talk is complete without something about culture. <laughs> But um, really at the heart of it, um, for us, for our work internally, we've, we've really um, embraced some of, the, some of the learnings from these larger organizations, uh, the, the other DevOps unicorns of the world and trying to take in what makes sense for us. And one thing that's been proven really powerful for us um, in, in uh, basically in February and March, we, we lost two engineers. So it was myself as the single engineer for this whole product for a short time. And, um, and right before 
uh, we lost these two. We had just, I had just been reading up on this idea of mob programming. And so internal to our team, we had started this idea over Zoom to basically work together on just one thing. And we found this to be very powerful for us. We had originally sort of had three different work streams with three people doing different things. But guess what? A lot of these things integrate. A lot of these things need to integrate. A lot of these things require communication between those three engineers. And we were finding we were just, everyone was working hard, but we weren't actually getting every, anything over the line. We were just getting, you know, we'd get it to get somewhere and then we'd get either distracted by some integration problem or a question or what have you. And instead, we're on Zoom now, almost, <laughs> hate to admit it, but it's probably like six to seven hours on average a week, or sorry, seven, six to seven hours a day, you know, over the course of the week. Um, so more, more than our normal time doing meetings or anything else. And so that has actually surprisingly done a lot of things for us. It's given us, um, I was able to onboard two new engineers get them up to speed. Each of them took about 30 calendar days and um, they're already contributing code and we're actually meeting some of the targets that we, we had had prior to the departure of the other two um, engineers. So when we talk about speed of delivery, we're, we're actually increasing our speed of delivery of different feature sets. Um, and uh, the other part of our culture from a DevOps team perspective is that we, um, do this idea of um, a blameless postmortem if we do have any issues. Maybe it's not an actual outage per se, um, but something went wrong. Something didn't happen as expected. And so we walk through a blameless postmortem process. We um, evaluate how we work. We evaluate, we use an agile method, mostly Scrum, with a lot of experimentation around it. Um, our product managers have been awesome about this as well, where we spend um, sometimes we spend an entire retro talking about whether our next sprint should be a week or three weeks, two weeks, whatever. And, um, and we're finding, you know, that it just really depends on the product we're offering, what features we're building, what are we, what are we trying to accomplish here? And, and we can actually, we have the freedom in the locality to, to change our goals, to, to push things in a different way that meets whatever developer questions are, or highest value for this next piece of, of the product and, and we can make those decisions and we can get those organized. Um, and from an IT organization standpoint, so this is our, that was our little group. Um, but then HITS as a whole, as I mentioned, has, has a very strong, um, I forgot the name for it. I think it might be called matrix organization, shared services everywhere. Um, the, the, the database people hardly talk to the storage people, hardly talk to the OS people. Um, and so we're working to change that. We're working, we're presenting at committees. We're um, on the other side too, developers who don't have any, any knowledge of the environment that they're actually developing for. We try to bring them in to conversations with some of these other teams to at least help um, everyone just kind of get along a little better and not feel like we're just throwing things over walls at each other and um, trying to partner with different developers and show them how we work. And so kind of our, our hope as we're building this is that we can um, build up something that will not just increase adoption of cloud or um, save HITS some money or any of that, but that actually as a culture, our, our department can be a leader in um, delivering value to customers and, and not just uh, and I should say delivering value, but also meeting our compliance needs, our reliability needs, all those things. So, yep, it's, um, yeah, as Melissa mentioned, it's, we're, we're 800 plus people in just our IT department. So there's just a ton of us and it's very hard um, to affect change in that manner. But we really hope that with this, with this product, but more than the product with this culture that we're trying to, um, this culture of experimentation and learning, we hope to expand across HITS. So I left a question slide, but I see we're uh, running up to time. I'm sorry I talked so long. <laughs> that was a tremendous presentation. Thank you folks so much. Uh, I love the comprehensiveness. Uh, it's really hard to explain from origin to implementation to next steps. And I think you, you folks did it magically. Um, 
I've got a lot of questions. I can hit pause button on mine. Other folks, questions, feel free to unmute yourself and, and ask away. Uh, oh, actually, I see Alec uh, mentioned about how, how about data base? Data is our, our, our most fun and most challenging space for sure. Um, we do recommend different technologies based on other developers' experience and um, try to get people to talk to each other. So there's there are these flyways and liquid bases of the world that um, we try to actually extend out and say, um, and maybe someday we can kind of take a little bit more of that, but what we're, we try to say is like, here's what other people are doing in this space. And um, here's at least the schema change uh, situation taken care of. Uh, on our side, we have disaster recovery mechanisms and uh, depending on price ranges and you know research budgets and other pieces, we can also enable point in time recovery of any of our database instances. So at, at the very least, when a researcher has this giant database and they know that at some point this thing got blown up, um, we can at least go back to this point in time and keep some of this other data but it, it still is a challenge and we don't have a, all the solutions for it for every every case that you know is coming forward right but uh we try to do our best and silos yes thank you i think a few people said that yeah <laughs> that our organization is is heavily siloed all right well i'll uh, i'll jump in with a, a quick question i'm very curious um uh partially because we're trying to sort out how we want to think about use of containers in a secure environment that we're, we're developing. And so um, you mentioned something about your, your, your developers and folks and, and, and them coming to terms with understanding how to build containers. And so I'm curious if you could say anything more about that. How, did you, um, how, do, you, how do you think to approach the, the question of solving, um, you know, folks who are like trying to learn how to use containers and then integrate that with your systems. Yes. Um, for us, we, we, we're we actually just slowly onboarding different customers that have varying needs. So uh, thanks to Melissa and Chanel, we did, a, we did quite a bit of research into the area. What do, what do developers know? What do they not know? And then basically taking it, we're taking a very small funnel right now so that we can build up labs, documentation and examples to help developers know what's the next big thing, right? To, for me to learn. And we hope that that, that just um, alleviates like meeting with us or putting us in the middle of it, right? Instead, here's this environment, here's some good labs, here's some examples, especially like, like I mentioned with GitLab, right? So there's GitLab pipeline. So, that, so Here's, here's our project, a, a, an example project that you can go and deploy to your environment. And, and each of these paces or each of these pieces is heavily commented to explain here, this, this is what we're trying to do here. There's many ways to do it. And in fact, even sometimes we'll even say documented here at cloud.google.com, you know, slash docs, right? And hoping that we're, we're, we're building a culture where developers can find the information they need and start to just sort of get their feet wet without, without, uh, <laughs> without doing something that 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 could uh, hurt our organization. Understood. Thank you. And developer uh, UX right now too. I saw there's another question. They um, currently it is a ticket, and our long term goal is a merge request. <laughs> so, um, you know, so we're <laughs> we are on that path, but it is not here yet. Tremendous. Well, we are we are at time, and be, before we go, I want to thank the speakers again. It was a tremendous presentation, and I hope to continue the dialogue with you folks between our two groups. I'd also like to thank Tiffany Vo, who's been an intern working with us. Um, this is her uh, final engagement with us, so thank you very much, Tiffany. And uh, everybody, have a, a wonderful rest of the week. Thanks so much.